Well, it's manifest again on the air in your country or in your city. And thank you for joining me today. I just want to remind those of you that can attend that our International Prophetic Summit for 2023 will be the last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the month of April. You can go to perrystone.org to get the information and to register for that great event with many different speakers, some of the most powerful speakers in the world today that know the prophetic word. Speaking of the prophetic word, we've been dealing last week with Elijah and the appearance of Elijah during the first 42 months of the tribulation period. And then we concluded by telling you that the rebuilding of a temple is connected to Elijah's responsibilities of restoring all things that Christ predicted would take place uh, at the time of the end. Now, there's three basic things I want you to understand. The title of my teaching is The Tribulation, the Treaty, and the Temple. So let's look at this. The, tri the Tribulation, the Treaty, and the Temple. What am I talking about? The tribulation is known in the Old Testament by different names. It is called the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's called the day of the Lord. It is known as Jacob's trouble. In Daniel 9, verse 27, it's a period of seven years in length. That's also clear from the book of Revelation that divides the seven years up into 42 months and 42 months, two separate periods yet connected together. Then there is something called the treaty. Now, what is the treaty? The treaty is a covenant that will be made with the Antichrist and many nations, including the nations of Israel. And that treaty is first alluded to in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. But in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, which is Paul's first epistle that he ever wrote after his conversion to Christ, and he wrote it to the church at Thessaloniki, Greece, he says this in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, that they will cry peace and safety, and then a sudden destruction shall come upon them, and they shall not escape. Peace and safety there can be translated as peace and security. Israel is always concerned about its security, especially with its bordering neighbors. And so what will happen at the time of the end, and I'll tell you when I think it's going to happen as far as the prophetic timing, there will be a covenant or a firm agreement that's what a covenant is, made with many nations for a period of seven years. Then the third aspect of this, which is seldom taught or alluded to, is that the New Testament teaches us that there will be a temple that will exist in Jerusalem the first 42 months of the tribulation period. Now, when I say temple, most of you think of this massive structure that would hold maybe, uh, you know, five to 10,000 people. The temple building in the time of Christ, as far as the temple itself, no, not the court area, the court areas were very large, was very small and much smaller than you could even imagine. One time many years ago, uh, we were in Israel and we just stepped off the measurements on the Temple Mount itself of how big a Jewish temple would be. And yet we were stunned at how that as far as what we would call the inner court and holy of holies was not that large. However, the situation presently is there is no temple anywhere in the city of Jerusalem. Now, there are synagogues, but a synagogue is not the temple. In the time of Christ, it's estimated that in, in the locations of Israel, there were 480 synagogues, but there was only one temple. The synagogues is where you met every Shabbat, and it's where the different ceremonies were performed. However, the temple was where the sacrifices were made. And it's where <clears throat> three festivals out of a year, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, all men that were over 20 years of age had to go up to the city of Jerusalem. Now, there has been a, a, an historical record given to us in the Bible about dwelling places of God in the area of Israel. The first dwelling place of God was the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was built by Moses in the wilderness and later transported by the children of Israel from the wilderness into the promised land or what we today call the nation of Israel. Now, the tabernacle tent, and it was a tent, existed from the time of Moses' construction to the time of the building of Solomon's temple for 440 years. 
after the Solomon's temple was destroyed, they then came back and they, uh, and it was destroyed, of course, during the time of the Babylon invasion. But when the Jews then returned from Babylon, and this was Ezra and Nehemiah, and you can read about this in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, in the Old Testament. But when Ezra and Nehemiah came back with the Jewish captives from Babylon and they rebuilt the, on the ruins of Solomon's temple, but the glory was not even close to what Solomon's temple was, but it was still a temple nonetheless in Jerusalem. Uh, that temple from the time of the rebuilding until the time of the Babylonian captivity is 410 years. Now, let me go back and make a statement. I said something about to Babylon. From the wilderness to Solomon's temple is 440 years and from Solomon's temple to the Babylonian captivity is about 410 years. Now, <clears throat> the situation that you deal with in talking about a temple that's going to come in the future is the fact that there is no temple or Jewish temple or Jewish presence of a temple in the city of Jerusalem. And as you know, we've talked about there were synagogues, 480 synagogues in the time of Christ, but no, uh, only one temple. So what were the dwelling places of God? The Bible tells us that there were three major dwelling places of God and also history records. There were three dwelling places of God located in the nation of Israel. Now the first is the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle of Moses was a portable tent that was built in the wilderness. And you can read about this in the Torah in the Old Testament, the five books of Moses. And it existed in the wilderness. And then Joshua brought the tabernacle into the promised land, what we call the conquest of the promised land. And after the death of Joshua, of course, and during the time of Joshua, which he lived 30 years in the promised land, we have the tabernacle being used for the sacrifices and for all the rituals that God required in the five books of Moses. So that tabernacle was used from the time of Moses to the time of Solomon's temple being built in the days of Solomon and that temple took about seven years to build. Now when Solomon completed his temple, they ceased the sacrifices and the offerings at the tabernacle of Moses. So the tabernacle of Moses was in use for 440 years. Now here's what happened. Solomon's temple becomes the temple. It's not a tabernacle. It is a solid temple built of stone and had a lot of gold in it, wood, etc. So from the time of Solomon's temple to the time of the Babylonian invasion by King Nebuchadnezzar, that is a period of 410 years. So what we call the first temple, and when you hear the term first temple, that always refers to the temple that Solomon built. When we refer to the first temple, it existed for 410 years. Now, during the Babylonian captivity, it lasted 70 years. The Jews later returned from Babylon back to the promised land and they began to reconstruct and rebuild the waste places. And one of the things they did is they began to rebuild the temple that was in ruins. The book of Haggai talks about this. this um, Zechariah alludes to this. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, detail the activity involved with the priest and the men returning from captivity in Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild this temple. Now, this rebuilt temple was called the second temple because it was built on the ruins and with the stones of the first temple. Now, from the rebuilding of that temple to the time they sacrificed their first sacrifice to the destruction of that temple, in 70 AD is approximately 600 years. So you had one dwelling place for over 400 years. You had a second dwelling place for 410 years. You had a third dwelling place that was used for 600 years. So you can see that, if I can say it this way, the Jewish footprint for the city of Jerusalem and for that the temple mount called Mount Moriah, that's what it was called, it goes back for over a thousand years. And I've talked about a thousand years in length of dwelling places being in the land or being uh, there, uh, especially on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. Now, when we when we when we talk about the Temple Mount, let's get it. Let's give the people an aerial view right now of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The entire area, uh, not just where the dome sits or the Al Aqsa Mosque sits, but all the open space is about 37 acres, according to estimates. Now, if we go back again to Scripture. We have three direct references to this mountain. This mountain was known as Mount Moriah in the Old Testament time. It is called Mount Moriah in Genesis 22, where God says to Abraham, take your son to the land of Moriah and offer him on a place where I will show you. And that, that offering area 
where Abraham placed Isaac on the altar in Genesis chapter 22 was the Temple Mount area. We do not know the exact spot. Some thinks it was on the rock inside the dome. Say, some say it was the other location. We don't know exactly. But nonetheless, that is where Abraham offered Isaac. So that's the first major record of Abraham, God's covenant man, going to the land of Moriah, which would later be the city of Jerusalem, and marking it with an offering to God. And of course, he, he, when I say that, marking it as an offering, we do know he appeared there in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek to give tithe to Melchizedek. But as far as the tithe was a physical tithe, this was considered an offering. And of course, Isaac got up off that altar, which was a picture of Jesus being crucified and right raising up from the dead in the area of Mount Moriah, which is near where Calvary is, Golgotha. And that's where Christ was crucified. This area in the time of King David was called a threshing floor. It was the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite. And the whole area were, was controlled in David's time by a group of people, a tribal group called the Jebusites. And when the Jebusites uh, built a threshing floor there and Arnon the Jebusite uh, threshed wheat there. Now in 2 Samuel 24, David purchased the mountain and the threshing floor from Ornan the Jebusite. So now we have the first record of Mount Moriah having a title deed belonging to David and King David and his descendants, and that's in 2 Samuel 24. Now, after David died, his son Solomon built a temple on the Temple Mount, and it tells us in 2 Chronicles 3 and 1 that it was built on Mount Moriah. So you have Mount Moriah with Abraham, Mount, Mor Mount Moriah with David purchasing it, Mount Moriah with Solomon building the temple. So in the future, any temple that would be constructed of any form is not going to be constructed anywhere else in in Israel except in the city of Jerusalem and in the area called Mount Moriah. And so this is where the controversy really begins to come in. Now, someone have, has asked me for years, they said, what proof do you have there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem? All right, let's go to some verses in the Bible, and these are going to come up on the screen right now. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall not come except there come the falling away first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, that verse is about the Antichrist. It's very clear. Scholars will agree on that. But I want you to notice he is sitting in the temple of God. Now, in Paul's day when he wrote that, the temple was the Jewish temple that would later be destroyed in 70 AD. Paul is alluding to a future event involving the Antichrist, which has not yet happened. And he mentions sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist invades Jerusalem. And when he invades Jerusalem in the middle of the seven year tribulation, and that's when it occurs, and the record of him coming into Jerusalem will be in uh, 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 it actually begin in Revelation 11 with the two witnesses. Then you have Revelation 12, the, the Jews fleeing to the wilderness. And you have Revelation 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, building and constructing an image in Jerusalem. So Revelation 11, 12, and 13 is what we call the middle of the tribulation period. Okay, so the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation kills these two witnesses that we, we alluded to last week. And then he builds these, the, uh, he sets up an image there on the, in the temple. In fact, in the book of Daniel, it says that on the wing of the temple will come the abomination, Daniel chapter 9. And that abomination is the image of the beast that's recorded in Revelation 13 that the false prophet will supernaturally give power to in making that beast speak and live. Now, the temple mount is the area and I probably should have said this earlier, but you, you, is, is the area that was once called East Jerusalem. All the Temple Mount used to be what is called East Jerusalem and was once under the country of Jordan. Now, before 1967, the country of Jordan had been given, let's say from 1948 to 67, the country of Jordan had been given uh, half of, Jer of Jerusalem and the east half was Arab East Jerusalem and it was the country of Jordan. The western half was the Jewish and the Christian section. Of course, there were Christians living in East Jerusalem as well. But the idea is that the Temple Mount was once divided between two countries. And now uh, it, the Israeli government gives, of course, the Muslims total access to the Temple Mount and the control there. But the East Jerusalem area is also under the control or the, uh, let me say this, under the uh, uh, authority of the, uh, the Israeli government at this point, although it's shared with the Arabs. Now, 
In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2, gives a, gives a prediction, and this is, I may add, a prediction about the tribulation period, that half of the city will go into captivity. So this will be when the Lord is preparing to return. Zechariah 14 tells, tells us that right after the Jerusalem goes into captivity, that the Lord returns to the Mount of Olives. That captivity is the Antichrist taking over Jerusalem and going into the western section, which will be the Jewish Christian section, and he will try to annihilate and eliminate the Jewish people from that western section of Jerusalem. Now, another example that talks about a temple, we talked about this last week, is Revelation 11, 1 through 3. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure, for it is given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the city uh, underfoot for 42 months. Now this is written in 95 AD, 25 years after the temple was destroyed, and this is a verse that deals with the tribulation period. Now notice this, the outer court of the, of the Jewish temple area is given to the Gentiles, handed over to the Gentiles, but then they will come and trample the city the last 42 months of the tribulation period, and that's when the Antichrist comes and invades Jerusalem. So why is the outer court given to the Gentiles? Because there will be an agreement made at some point that where, where the Dome of the Rock sits, which is the Muslim mosque, it will continue to remain. I've heard all kinds of theories. None of them are biblical about, oh, they're going to, they're going to, the Jews are going to pay the Muslims to move the dome. That's never going to happen. It's the third holiest site in Islam or an earthquake is going to take it down. Well, that's happened before and they will just rebuild it. And, uh, you know, I've heard all kinds of theories, but you're not going to destroy that third holiest site. An earthquake will come on the Mount of Olives when Messiah returns in Zechariah 14. It'll destroy everything there. But uh, as far as the tribulation, it being moved in the Jews building there, it's not going to happen. They will build probably to the northern area, definitely to the north. You're not going to do much in the south. It's just two mosques, but they'll rebuild somewhere in the northern area. Now that's in the future, and that will be done after a treaty is signed by the Antichrist. Now, uh, this is also mentioned in Matthew 24, 15 through 16. When therefore you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken up by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, let him that reads understand that on him which is in Judea flee to the mountains. Now the abomination here would refer to Revelation chapter 13, 14, where the false prophet builds an image and the Greek word is icon, an icon to the beast and he supernaturally makes it speak, speak and live, live. And if you don't worship the image of the beast or take the mark, you will be killed and beheaded. Now Daniel talks about there's an abomination that makes Jerusalem desolate. This is all the same thing. Daniel sees it first in Daniel. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, or Matthew writes about it in Matthew 24, and then John sees it later in the book of Revelation. So it all ties together. The word desolation means to, to lay waste. And he says, when you see this, flee to the mountains. So when, now watch carefully, when in the middle of the tribulation period, that the Antichrist takes the city and builds the image and causes it to speak and live, the Jewish people of any kind that are religious would never worship an image and they flee to the mountains and the fleeing is to, uh, in Revelation 12, the wilderness of Edom and Moab, which is the area of Petra in Jordan, because in the book of Daniel, the country of Jordan is never taken over by the Antichrist. It is spared being taken over by the Antichrist. That's a whole nother teaching we could get into. There's, there's a reason for that. So Petra is in the country of Jordan. Now the treaty is going to be when? I personally believe, and I'm, I'm going to run out of time here probably, but in, in, in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a war of Gog and Magog. In that war, there are numerous Islamic nations that lose the majority of their armies. Then there is a treaty signed. In that treaty, it talks about destroying weapons for seven years. Daniel 9, 27 talks about a treaty made with many. I believe that what Ezekiel saw was the same thing as the seven-year treaty in the book of Daniel 9, 27, which in initiates the seven period of tribulation. It has not happened yet. The war has not happened yet. There are alignments that show it could happen, but it's down the road. Now, when this seven-year agreement happens, that's when the two witnesses come to Jerusalem, the first 42 months of the tribulation period, and one of those will be Elijah. They will rebuild that temple. And it's real interesting that according to um, uh, uh, scholars who live in Jerusalem, if there was a temple to be rebuilt, 
it wouldn't happen instantly. It would actually take, and boy, I wish I had time to talk about, you have to do certain things during feast days. You have to have the ashes of the red heifer to purify it. There's so many rituals that Jewish people who are devout Jewish people that believe in the temple would have to go through. Listen to this, that one of the scholars in Jerusalem, he is a scholar at the Hebrew University, said that if a temple was rebuilt, it's not just placing the stones in place and getting the treaties together. It would take three and a half years before you could actually go into it and worship. This is what I see, that the Antichrist signs a seven-year treaty. The Jews build this temple. By the time they three and a half years to complete it. Then he comes in to kill the two witnesses that helped rebuild it. And it says he causes the sacrifice to cease. He will cause the sacrifice to cease at that temple. He will take it over, put the image there. Bam. Then you have the final part of the tribulation period. And I had to get that in, in a short period of time. I know this is a very detailed teaching and, um, We'll talk about that uh, later. We're doing a, a prophetic series for a while, and then we have a secret project that's going to be released very soon. And I, I believe a lot of you are going to want to participate when you see this. It's very unique. Never done nothing like it before. Never, we'll never do nothing like it again. I can tell you that. But right now we're on a prophetic theme. The soon closing out of the church age, when God, God's mercy ends, God's wrath begins. And also, will Jesus come by 2023, examining the biggest pivotal transition date? These are new. They're available now. And we'll tell you how to get it. This is Perry Stone. I am so excited to be able to present to you and your family two of the most exciting audio teachings that I have done in many years. Will Jesus Return by 2033? And the special teaching, The Soon Closing Out of the Church Age. Now, I want to talk for a moment and tell you that I'm not predicting the return of Christ in 2033, but I am saying to you that it is the most pivotal transitional date that we have encountered in our lifetime and in modern history. And I'm going to show you why that 2033 is the most important prophetic date in the prophetic cycle. And we're going to talk about God's calendar and God's timing and the events surrounding where we are going in the distant future. I also want to present to you a very special teaching, the soon closing out of the church age. The church age is also known as the dispensation of the grace of God, and it will eventually come to a conclusion with Christ's return. Then the wrath of God is going to be globally released in what is called the Great Tribulation. Now, on this two audio CD series, you will discover details on how, why, and when this major prophetic transition will occur. Man, this is a very powerful message. It is filled with fascinating new insight, and it provides keys to understanding soon coming events. Now, you can now get both of these audio CD messages. There are four CDs, four hours of teaching for your love gift of $30 or more. We really need your help to keep manifest on the air. The way that you order this special teaching is by going to perrystone.org and ordering online or call 1-888-21-BREAD toll free and order that way. Or you can also write me at Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. Now, when you call or write, you have to request offer number PR-138. And it is the special brand new prophecy updates. We're hoping to hear from you and we just pray that God will continue to bless you. Make plans to attend the 2023 International Prophetic Summit, April 27th through 30th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. Come hear the latest prophecy updates from Jonathan Kahn, Lance Wallnow, Jimmy Evans, Mark Biltz, Bill Cloud, and Perry Stone. There is no fee to attend, but you must register online at perrystone.org, where you will also find information on hotels in the area. Seating is limited, so sign up today. Don't miss fresh insights and exciting new prophetic revelation at the 2023 International Prophetic Summit. Register now. All right, now, um, this might be, we're not sure, we may have another airing of this, but this may be one of your final opportunities to get the offer, the brand new offer, uh, four hours of teaching on audio. Uh, will Jesus return by 2033 and the soon closing out of the church age? You know, let me tell you something. When, when, I, when I work on this material, this is not just stuff I'm just sitting down and just kind of blowing stuff off the top of my head. I dig and pray and hear from the Lord on so many things. I never write a book. I never do a, a, a DVD or any kind of resource, I should say, unless I really have something 
that I know is going to help you. Now, if you uh, want to uh, order a download, you can go to perrystone.org and do it that way as well. But uh, please, this helps keeps, man keeps manifest on the air. Now, uh, we have been sharing with you for quite some time. Our partners know about this. And I'm going to make an announcement in a, in a week or two. We're not sure exactly wh which week it'll be, but it should be in February. We're going to be releasing a secret project that I have been working on. You know, honestly, I, I think it's probably, it'll be three years in June that I will have started working on this. And it's taken about two to two and a half years to perfect it. And uh, listen to me very carefully with what I'm going to say. At this moment of time, when, when this project is released, it's going to be very different. It's going to be very unique. I have never done anything like this in the history of my ministry. There's 35,000 people that can immediately, and I say immediately, uh, you, you'll understand it when you see it and hear it, participate in this at the beginning, 35,000 people. So if you're watching me, you're a partner of my ministry, I suggest that you move quickly when this is released. Now, it's going to take us some time to get some of the information to you. It'll t you know, you, you can't just call the office one day and the next day get it. But when this, when this comes available, give us time because we're going to be inundated with people who want this, who want the information. I know that without a doubt. And I know you're saying, tell us what it is. I can't tell you what it is yet. There's a reason for it. So I want you to participate in this and uh, you'll hear more about it when the time comes. We're going to advertise it on Manifest. We're going to advertise it on YouTube, on Facebook, bam, all at one time. And uh, there has been some shortages in the United States, and that's why it's been delayed a little bit. It should have been released at the end of the year of 2022, but it, there were shortages. Anyway, uh, go to perrystone.org for more information. Perrystone Ministries Facebook page. Do not forget every Tuesday night, there's a service at Omega Center International. I think they have moved the starting time now to seven o'clock on Tuesday nights, if I'm not mistaken. And also uh, the prayer on Thursday at six o'clock East Coast time. Uh, and all of this is available to you to tap into, to be a part of and participate in. And uh, we appreciate you so very much. We're looking forward next week. And don't forget, be looking for the special teaching. I'll be outside releasing the secret project. God bless you. Expand your understanding of scripture. Advance your effectiveness in ministry. Earn certification for your knowledge of the Bible. International School of the Word is an online Bible school dedicated to bringing an affordable biblical education to students around the world. It's ISO's mission to connect the Word with the world by offering accessible, sound teaching online. At ISO.org, we offer lifetime access to high quality courses that can be taken at your own pace. Earn one of our certificates or find a specific course that interests you. Whether you want to learn about theology, Bible history, Greek and Hebrew, church administration, or one of our many other fascinating subjects. Join ISO today to see what thousands of students are so excited about.